audio of AP Euro period for review. This is the last uh, of the periods of the course content, um, starting with World War I, going through the inner war years of the Age of Anxiety, into World War II and the Cold War, and also the post-war developments. Okay, so just to review first, let's start with the causes of World War I. Remember we had the um, um, anachronism mania, militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and awful governments, or as we also know, assassination could also be another A, the Balkan crisis that happens with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Militarism, remember, was the um, a, a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution with the buildup of um, new military technology, um, which also resulted in an arms race between um, ultimately Great Britain that was on one side of the alliance systems, which we'll talk about in a moment, and of course Germany on the other side. Um, the alliance systems themselves were part of this. Remember, they were designed initially to try to keep people out of war, but ultimately ended up pulling everyone in. You have the triple alliance on one hand, made up of Germany and Austria and Italy initially. Then, of course, um, the Ottoman Empire added to that alliance and Italy pulling out of it. Then on the other side, you have the... Um, Triple Entente, which is made up of France and Russia and Great Britain. Then, of course, nationalism is the end for um, mania. Nationalism is something that we see evident throughout all of these nation states as they are uh, building up their empires in imperialism. Um, it is a very nationalistic thing um, to take these territories for the glory of their country. Of course, that's also connected to imperialism. Uh, the desire for more spheres of influence to gain access to raw materials for their industries as well as new markets for their products, which leads to increased competition between nations over those spheres of influence, which leads to more um, militaristic uh, strikes on each other over these territories, which leads to the creation of alliances to try to avoid wars between them, etc., etc. They are all interconnected. Uh, the assassination of Franz, Franz Ferdinand, of course, in the Balkan crises that were going on were part of it, but also awful governments. The fact that many of the governments of these nations um, were just not good governments and they continued to um, um, up the ante and the rhetoric towards one another. Um, you also have Ars as one <laughs> that a colleague of mine came up with. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, the timeline, then Russia mobilizes their troops, then the Schlieffen plan is put into place by the Germans, and then England declares war. Of course, you know, all of the other nations falling into place involved with that as well. The nature of World War I, of course, the modern technology, um, uh, the bringing industrial technology into military, uh, the creation of new military weapons, this will lead to more uh, lethal warfare on the Western Front. In particular, we see it. We talked about examples of the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme trench warfare is a uh, development of that as well as we know uh, the destructiveness and of course a lot of stalemate as a result of that stalemate of course does not mean no fighting is going on it means massive amounts of fighting and death with very little gain on either side so this kind of warfare was very wasteful and led to the feelings of loss the lost generation um, the feelings of alienation that many will have in the post-war world, feeling betrayed by their governments, feeling um, as if they just became numbers or even sheeps being led to the slaughter.
Of course, uh, the Marne River is where the Western Front line was drawn. Um, the Battle of the Marne was the German offensive in France that ultimately led to the creation of that Western Front line. That was the last part of that um, Schlieffen plan that failed. Um, we look at another other examples of stalemate warfare along the Western Front. Of course, the Battle of Verdun that we talked about before. Of course, in the Battle of the Somme, the British offensive in France. Uh, both of these battles, whether it's a, a, a central power offensive, German offensive, or a allied power offensive like at the Somme, they both took huge amounts of casualties with very minimal gain. Both are examples of modern warfare using outdated military tactics as well. Yes, it was modern um, war warfare, but outdated military tactics of trying to meet each other on the battlefield, even though you're dug into trenches with very little gains being made on either side. The U.S. involvement, of course, as we know, does not come until the last year of the war. Woodrow Wilson was president and was sometimes referred to as being, quote, too proud to fight wanting his idealism to, to win out and wanting to remain isolationists, the United States wanting to remain isolationists. But as we know, eventually the U.S. will be brought into the war. Number of different things that were catalysts to that, of course, the sinking of the Lusitania and the Americans on board the Lusitania, the use of German unrestricted submarine warfare attacking our ships that were supplying the Allies, even though we technically said we were neutral and isolated, we actually were supplying the um, Allied powers on the Western Front. So our ships being sunk by the Germans through unrestricted submarine warfare was another factor in bringing us into the war finally. And of course the straw that breaks the camel's back is the Zimmerman note that the Germans sent to the, um, to the government of Mexico trying to get them to attack the United States to keep us occupied um, instead of joining the war, which ultimately brings us into the war. Wilson's 14 points, of course, are a big part of World War I. He is the only world leader that had any kind of proposal for peace in the world after the war was over. Uh, the gist that you need to remember of the 14 points was that he wanted self-determination to reign the day. Um, he wanted it to be uh, fair um, for those new nations that were going to be carved out of the old empires that uh, had fallen um, due to the losses in World War I. Um, and he was willing to negotiate away most of his points in order to get the League of Nations, the creation of um, a, an international organization based on open diplomacy um, and self-determination and the irony of it is that yes the League of Nations will be formed but no the United States will not become a member of it because the United States Senate never ratifies the Versailles Treaty that creates the League of Nations. This means that the League of Nations from the get-go is a paper tiger with no real t teeth to um, enforce anything, which sort of sets the stage for why World War II will happen in the future. The failure of the League of Nations will be one of the factors leading to World War II. Now, of course, another factor of World War I that we also need to remember is the home front. Uh, the mobilization of society, the entire society around, um, around the war effort. Uh, big government, uh, of course, meaning centralized planning of the economies with price controls, the banning of strikes uh, in exchange for, you know, the fact that we all have to be behind the, the war effort here, rationing of food as well as other materials that could be used for the war effort, planned use of natural resources, a planned economy. Of course, propaganda to try to drum up support at home for these initiatives utilized by those governments. Women, of course, working in those factories even more than before because the men were off fighting on the front lines. And of course, this is why at the end of the war, the suffragettes make demands for even more um, of a say in government. So of course, the legacy of Emmeline Pankhurst. Um, in Great Britain in particular will lead to the women's rights 
movement and getting the vote in 1918 after the war is over. The armistice itself, of course, was proclaimed on 11 a.m. on November 11th, 1918, Armistice Day, what we now call Veterans Day in this country. It was an end to the hostilities. Uh, Germany feared a communist revolt at the time, and so they felt that they had to um, agree to the armistice. We know that by this point, the Kaiser has been removed from power, and the Weimar Republic has been uh, put in place, and communist revolts were happening all over Europe, not just in Germany. Uh, the Kaiser had to abdicate his throne, um, the creation, like I said, of the Republic in Germany known as the Weimar Republic. The Paris Peace Conference, of course, is where the big four come together to um, hammer out this treaty, the Versailles Treaty being the largest of those treaties at the Paris Peace Conference. Of course, the big four are the U.S., France, Great Britain, and Italy. Uh, Woodrow Wilson from the U.S., David Lloyd George from Great Britain, George Clemenceau from France, and Vittorio Orlando from Italy. Um, the U.S. under the uh, idealistic Woodrow Wilson wants to, of course, have a friendly peace with self-determination determining things. It's not what they're going to get with the Versailles Treaty, however, because Great Britain and in, per in particular France wanted payback and to ensure that Germany would not ever be a threat again. That did not work out so well for them, obviously. The Treaty of Versailles, of course, is what uh, comes out of these negotiations. Germany was forced to take the blame with Article 231, and that, of course, set the stage for them having to accept these heavy war reparation payments to France and Great Britain. They lose all of their colonies. They lose their border territories to France, of course, Alsace and Lorraine and they lose territories to Poland as well, that Polish corridor, which will cut off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. The Rhineland was to be demilitarized, supposedly on both sides, on both the French and German side, but we know that the Germans will maintain um, their side being armed when uh, Germany is not able to make their war reparation payments on time. And the map of Europe, will be quite different in 1919 than it was in 1914. What's going on in Russia? As we know, Tsar Nicholas II uh, during the war decides that he was going to lead the front, lead, lead the troops on the front while leaving Rasputin and his wife in charge of what's going on domestically. Russia, of course, was losing the war on the Eastern Front. Thousands of Russians were held as prisoners. Millions of Russians were dying. The lack of food, in particular the lack of bread, not just for the soldiers, but for all of Russian society, ultimately leads to many revolts within Russia against the war effort. Um, Nicholas uh, ultimately is forced to abdicate his throne when he loses his base of support by um, 1917. We know that the revolution in Russia happens in two phases. It happens in March or in February, depending on which calendar you use, which forces Nicholas to abdicate his throne, establishing a provisional government, and then eventually, by the fall, October or November, you have the Bolshevik Revolution. The March Revolution, remember the first one, is where the provisional government is established in Russia and it takes over long enough until a new government is drawn up in a constitution. At least that was the goal. Um, unfortunately for the provisional government, groups known as Soviets continued to form, combining workers and soldiers, and they consisted primarily of socialists who wanted a different kind of government than those Democrats in the provisional government wanted. Um, ultimately, the Petrograd Soviet was the most powerful of the Soviets, and they started to uh, gain a lot of steam to push against the provisional government. They wanted the provisional government to get Russia out of the war, but the provisional government decides to remain in the war, and that's why they eventually will lose their base of support and the Soviets gain more support.
This, of course, leads to the October or Bolshevik Revolution, um, uh, gaining popularity as the war continued in defeat after defeat after defeat. The Bolshevik Revolution was led, of course, by Lenin and Trotsky, and it resulted in a violent takeover of the government where the provisional government will fall. Uh, ultimately, Lenin will take control of the government and first order of business, peace, land, and bread. Of course, the first order of business is the peace part. Uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk pulls Russia out of World War I, giving Germany land in order to pull out of that war. Germany, however, will never really be able to capitalize on those land gains because within a year they will lose the war and much of that land will ha have new states carved out of it instead. The Communist Revolution would take over uh, in Germany, um, giving land back. Ultimately, the, um, rev the Communist revolters in Germany will be um, put down by the Weimar Republic, but the Weimar Republic had to depend upon militia groups um, in order to maintain order, and ultimately that gives rise to the Nazi Party, the right-wing extremists. The Civil War in Russia is the next phase that happens after the, um, the Bolshevik Revolution. Almost immediately, there's a challenge by those that either supported the monarchy, the return to monarchy, or those that supported a return to the way the democracy was going under the provisional government. They are known as the White Movement. And of course, the Red Army is, um, is the army that is raised by the Bolsheviks. Uh, Lenin depends upon Trotsky to raise that army. And they eventually will take over and be successful the, the Red Army will be successful, putting Lenin firmly in the driver's seat. Um, this will lead to a reign of terror to eliminate all opposition to the Bolsheviks. Um, they also want to, Lenin and Trotsky, believe in um, the Third International or Common Turn to try to aid in the expanding of the revolution to other countries. But ultimately, what ends up happening is war communism, the initial economic um, um, policy that was put in place by Lenin and the Bolsheviks does not work out well. In fact, produ production decreases, starvation increases, and this leads Lenin to have to take a different approach and initiate the new economic policy at home. Uh, which allows for a limited amount of private enterprise to help the economy after the Russian Civil War. Lenin, of course, will eventually die of a, um, of a series of strokes in 1924, which leads to the question of who will succeed him. In a totalitarian regime, whether left-wing like this one or right-wing, um, there is no guarantee of succession because it's not a dynastic tradition. It's the will of the dictator that um, gives the, um, the, well, the totalitarian regime its power. So it comes down to a question of who will it be? Will it be Trotsky, who had been Lenin's right-hand man, or will it be Stalin? Trotsky, remember, emphasized the spread of the revolution sooner rather than later, whereas Stalin believed the focus should be on the home front first to perfect the revolution at home first before extending it to others. And one of the critiques that he had was the fact that the NEP had a bit of capitalism in it, so obviously communism had not been perfected at home yet. Ultimately, Stalin will be able to take over. He will run Trotsky out of the nation, eventually having him murdered. Um, and Stalin really uh, solidifies totalitarian control in Russia. He initiates a series of five-year plans to turn the economy around in Russia through communism, which results in, yes, finally industrializing Russia fully, especially with heavy industry, but with the collectivization of land, it leads to a large, a widespread starvation and, of course, the targeting of the kulaks those uh, Russian um, landholders who had actually benefited under Lenin's NEP 
will be liquidated as a class under Stalin's purges and under his um, measures. Now back to the inner war years in Germany. We have the Weimar Republic, this new government that is formed after World War I, led by Friedrich Ebert, a moderate socialist, so not is a little left of center, if you will. Uh, but since the main threat was communism with that Spartacus revolt that happened, the Fry Corps or the Free Corps was a militia group that the that Ebert had to depend upon to put down the communist rebellions. And this gave way to the rise of more right-wing extremist um, groups in, in Germany. Of course, we know there is hyperinflation that is going on in the interwar years, largely due to the fact that uh, Germany cannot repay their war debts with their reparation payments. They have to borrow money from the United States eventually. Um, to try to resolve some of these issues. Uh, Gustav Stressman becomes the Chancellor of Germany in the mid-1920s uh, and enters the Locarno Agreement with France to try to alleviate some of the economic stresses and try to deal with the hyperinflation um, to a little bit of you know relief and of course that's when the Dawes plan comes into place which brings loans in from the United States to try to stabilize the German economy. Uh, in the 1920s be because the US economy was thriving we were able to lend money. Uh, the Dawes plan was our investment in Germany so it could pay its reparations to France and Britain who in turn could then pay back their US loans to us. But this all falls apart when the stock market crashes in 1929 causing the Great Depression to happen in the United States which causes a ripple effect throughout Europe and those loans, uh, the US banks calling in those loans from the Europeans and the European nations cannot pay them back causing an even more of an economic spiral. The Great Depression as I said resulted in the, the stock market crash and the bank failures in the US which caused widespread unemployment not just in the United States but worldwide. The impact was worldwide due to the reliance in Europe on those American loans. Germany, France, and Great Britain all suffer greatly as a result. John Maynard Keynes was a British economist who argued that the only way that governments could get out of these kinds of depressions was with the government taking control of the economies and priming the pump, if you will. Uh, creating a kind of triple to, trickle down economics. The government going into deficit spending to try to stimulate the economy and of course Roosevelt FDR in the United States gets elected with his plan, his New Deal, which is that just exactly that kind of um, economic plan, a Keynesian economic plan to pull the United States out of the depression. It will not happen overnight. As we know, it really does not fully happen until we start mobilizing for World War II. Now, in Europe, because of the Great Depression, because of the economic constraints that they are now under, which have been made worse by the worldwide depression, we know that economically depressed nations are more vulnerable to totalitarian takeovers, whether they are of the left wing or the right wing variety. The left-wing totalitarianism that we see on the rise in Europe, of course, is communism. And we see it being perfected in the Soviet Union, especially under Stalin. The right-wing variety of totalitarianism we see is fascism, and we see that happening in places like Italy first, but then, of course, being perfected in Germany under the Nazis, under Adolf Hitler. While communism had become the dominant style of dictatorship in the USSR, as you see, fascism appealed to right-wing radicals in Italy and Germany. Remember the common traits we saw with totalitarianism. Whether left or right-wing, they may be on opposite ends on their political ideology, where left-wing communists 
totalitarians attack the class system where and the right-wing fascists attack different ethnic groups they still use similar tactics to gain power and to keep power using things like censorship indoctrination and terror tactics to gain power and to keep power so the further apart you get on the political spectrum ideologically they still look very similar in their methodology and how they gain power and keep it using secret police forces as well with their terror tactics so let's talk about fascism a little bit first this is the right-wing totalitarianism what is fascism remember it started in Italy with Mussolini and his black shirts uh, fascism is a political philosophy which is anti-democratic anti-communist since it's on the right wing it's on the opposite end of communism and is anti-liberal fascism uses terror dictatorial practices and any available means to force compliance with its fascist demands fascists are often confused with communists because of their similar methods similar tactics but even though they use similar tactics to keep control their beliefs are diametrically opposed okay remember that one's this fascism is right-wing totalitarianism uh, now the national socialism that we see with the Nazis with the German fascists of course right-wing we see it almost like the right-wing totalitarianism perfected uh, with uh, the Nazi fascism in Germany of course under the leadership of Adolf Hitler his use of terror tactics using the Gestapo and the SS his secret police as well as um, you know uh, other terror tactics uh, Hitler pulled Germany out of the League of Nations uh, and began to ignore the international law so he could bring Germany back into a place of glory um, ultimately galvanizing Germany to get ready for World War II long before anyone else is ready for World War II. Uh, the Nuremberg Laws, of course, marked the beginning of Hitler's attempt to enforce his anti-Semitic policies, which he had outlined in his book Mein Kampf, uh, as well as how the Nazis would rise to power in Germany. And the economically depressed Germans went along with him because he was promising you know to have food on their tables and money in their pockets and in their bank accounts um, as long as they defied the international organization the League of Nations and international law which stabbed them in the back anyways with the unfair Versailles Treaty Hitler's policies Hitler began to build up all branches of the military going against the international um, laws going against the Versailles Treaty instituting the four-year plans to step up production in Germany and the building of war materials food and even the Autobahn remember those roads so he could get his German panzer tanks from place to place easily to further promote his plans Hitler also instituted forced labor conscription the abolition of unions and the creation of Nazi youth organizations to indoctrinate the young to toe the line and keep his policies going even after his death uh, churches were persecuted by extremist Nazis and clergy often went along with the Nazi teachings out of fear of reprisals more of his policies of course um, it was there was a constitutional government supposedly but we see it giving way to the dictatorship under the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler uh, especially after the signing of the Enabling Act in 1933 you can go back into your other notes and review that process how that happened from the elections of 1932 to uh, uh, what happens in 1933 ultimately regional politics governed by local party organizations um, will give way to the dictatorship uh, administratively all non Aryans were barred from office and politically it was a one-party state all affairs were handled by the Nazi bureaucracy 
and they call for the coordination of everything under Nazi control, the Gleichenschaltung. Judicially, the state and Nazi ideals were placed above traditional judicial precedents that had been in place in Germany. Punishment and arrest, as well as court procedures, were all barbarized, if you will, under not the Nazi regime. Um, racially, of course, the Nazis believed in the supremacy of the Aryan race, and this um, led them to justify persecution and extermination of all non-Aryans. In particular, the Jews and the Gypsies were targeted, and uh, other non-Aryans. Uh, this culminated ultimately in the killing of six million Jews in the Holocaust during World War II. Religiously, the Nazi policies, Protestant and Catholic churches throughout Germany were initially persecuted when they spoke out against Nazi theories. Hitler then tried to substitute Nazi party events and youth groups for religious gatherings. Um, militarily, of course, the Nazis will build up the military greatly and quickly. Uh, universal military service will be required. The government will fund research to develop new weapons throughout World War II um, and develop a highly disciplined army. Culturally, the culture conf, another culture conf under Hitler this time, <coughs> excuse me, was Hitler's struggle for domination over every aspect of thought and action by the Nazi ideals. He will control art, music, drama, motion pictures, um, usually of low quality and used for propaganda purposes. He will support writers and musicians only who express the greatness of the Germanic peoples like Wagner's operas. And he will glorify the image of the Nazi mother who stayed at home and took care of her family. Now Hitler's foreign policy, <clears throat> of course, uh, is what brings about, you know, World War II. Hitler wanted to control Europe, and he followed the policy of Lebensraum, or living space, which was originally set out in his book, Mein Kampf. Lebensraum means living space, and referred to Hitler's attempts to expand eastward to create more living space for the German Aryan race to grow and thrive, while eliminating those that occupy those lands, Slavs, in particular Jews, Gypsies, you name it. Anyone Hitler believed was to be inferior. Hitler's foreign policy ultimately leads to World War II, among other things. Now, also in the 20s, we see Western democracies in crisis. Great Britain sees the em emergence of the Labour Party um, to try to deal with some of the uh, economic issues in the uh, post-war years. France, we have the Popular Front um, blocking the possibility of a fascist victory in government there. Um, and the Popular Front leads to basically a coalition of some French communists, French traditional socialists, and other radicals, and this is all led by Leon Blum. Ultimately, the Popular Front does keep a, um, a totalitarian takeover at bay in France, but <clears throat> also leads to some um, um, problems down the road as we move towards World War II. Now in Spain, by the time we get to the um, um, early 30s, we have a civil war brewing in Spain. The nationalists versus the republicans. The nationalists are actually the ones that um, support a fascist takeover by their leader who what, had fascist leanings, Francisco Franco. Um, and Francisco Franco and the nationalists, the Spanish fascists, if you will, were supported by the fascist leaderships in Italy and in Germany by Mussolini and Hitler. Ultimately, Mussolini and Hitler saw the um, Spanish Civil War as a test case, as a dress rehearsal, if you will, for World War II. Will the um, 
democratic governments in France, Britain, and the United States come to the aid of the Spanish Republic when it is under threat of a fascist takeover? <clears throat> and, the, and the answer was no. Uh, by this point, the Great Depression was so horrible uh, that most of those nations were looking more inward rather than being concerned about what was going on externally that led the, to an appeasement like mentality towards what was going on here Stalin actually tried to support the Republicans not that he uh, had the same political ideology as the Spanish Republicans but to try to challenge the fascists there Great Britain and France both stayed out and of course this leads to a massacre of sorts throughout Spain but in particular at Guernica where the Spanish Republicans are wiped out by Franco's forces that are supported by the other <clears throat> European fascists. Uh, Guernica by Picasso shows the destruction of the Spanish Republic and the destruction ultimately of the Spanish people um, when they were not supported by the Western democracies. This of course <clears throat> is all part of this path to war once again starting in the 30s. Japan starts acting aggressively in China in 1931 taking over Manchuria uh, and causing mass ca massive casualties in that region. Um, Hitler of course marches his army into the Rhineland in 1936 then of course shortly after that Germany invades Austria and declares Anschluss. Uh, then Germany moves into Czechoslovakia and even though um, in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia and even though <clears throat> there is a Munich conference uh, where both Great Britain and France try to stop Hitler from doing this the Munich agreement ultimately allows for Germany to take the Sudetenland why why did they adopt this appeasement mentality largely because they had too many problems at home to deal with and the Sudetenland was where mostly uh, it was occupied by mostly Germanic peoples that was a territory that had once belonged to Germany before World War One <clears throat> so in order to avoid war neither Great Britain or France could sustain a war at this point because of their economies being in shambles so the appeasement mentality took over instead. Avoid war at all costs. Give in to the demands of Hitler on the little things to avoid an all-out war. Ultimately, they will find out in the long run that dictators like Hitler cannot be appeased. You give them an inch, they want to take a mile. The non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union was also a shock. Hitler had made a non-aggression pact with Stalin. They are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. They are reverse of each other. They are the most unlikely people who would come to an agreement. It's not an alliance, but it is a non-aggression pact where they both agree that they will not mess with each other as they try to take territories and they decide that they will divide up Poland um, <clears throat> in the long run. That was the supposed to, supposedly part of the agreement. Ultimately, of course, we know that Hitler invades Poland, and when he invades Poland, that is when World War I, sorry, World War II, <laughs> begins. <clears throat> the course of World War II. Some called it a phony war uh, because it was launched by ultimately an aggressive Hitler, but in reality, it is not a phony war. Um, the uh, after taking over Poland um, and of course Great Britain and France finally declaring war on Germany uh, they are not ready for war even though they've declared war on Germany it will take them a while to mobilize and Hitler maximizes um, on that bit of time he has to take over as much territory as he possibly can before they're able to mobilize. So he moves quickly through the Low Countries. He also invades Norway. Then he moves into uh, Belgium and France. France even falls. He catches them off guard. They had not been able to effectively mobilize before he moved in. This will leave Great Britain alone in the fight against a Nazi takeover of all of Europe. 
Um, of course, this leads to the Battle of Britain, and because of Britain's location as an island country, um, the German Luftwaffe will be used to try to soften up the target before an amphibious invasion can happen. And as we know, the Battle of Britain, even though it proves to be a loss for Germany, it's not really a massive victory for England, but they survive to fight another day. Uh, the Germans recognize that they are not going to be able to invade England, so instead they turn their attention eastward to towards the Soviet Union, which of course breaks the non-aggression pact that they had with Russia. This is Operation Barbarossa. They are not able to take over Russia quickly like they had hoped and they get bogged down in the south around Stalingrad and now are going to have to face a two-front war like they did in World War I. Almost simultaneously with Russia entering the war against Germany on the eastern front with of course Great Britain alone on the western front, Pearl Harbor is attacked by Japan who has now been added to the Axis alliance with uh, Germany and Italy and when um, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor it ensures that the United States will enter the war. We will be divided in our um, fighting though. We will be fighting on two fronts in both the Pacific and the European theaters. There are key turning points in World War II um, which ultimately end the offensive capabilities of the Axis powers and uh, put them on the defensive. Um, some key turning points, of course, the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942, uh, where after um, bitter, bitter fighting for months and months and months in the Soviet Union, the Soviets are able to finally turn the tide against the Germans and start pushing the Germans back slowly but surely out of Russian territory and the Soviets are now on the offensive but bitter bitter losses um, along the way. Uh, the Battle of Midway shows a turning point battle uh, in the Pacific where the US will be able to uh, turn the tide against the Japanese. The Japanese will lose their offensive capability and the US will be able to start their island hopping campaign to try to roll back the influence of Japan throughout the Pacific. But again, very many costly battles will have to be fought um, before it's over. Of course, this is still three years before the war is over, but it's the beginning of the tide turning. And of course, another key battle, the Battle of El Alamein in 1942 also in North Africa, where a combined uh, forces of, the, starting with the British, of course, the British against the Germans in North Africa, opening up the Mediterranean for the U.S. to come in and help the British invade Italy, pushing back the Axis powers there, finally falling with the capitulation of Mussolini and the Italians, and then of course moving upward from there. This of course will open up um, the ability for the Allies to open a new front of the war, something that Stalin had been asking for for years. By 1944, the British and um, Americans will open a new front um, with the Normandy invasion, D-Day, uh, uh, to attack the Germans in France and liberate France from German control. <clears throat> Eventually this will lead the Americans and um, British to be able to push it up through France into Belgium. They will meet the German last ditch offensive at the Battle of the Bulge in the Argonne Forest um, and ultimately be successful and then it's a race to Berlin my friends. The uh, Soviets pushing from the east, the um, combined American and British forces pushing from the west, uh, the French that had been freed of course are with them as well and of the Berlin Falls in May of 1945 to the Soviets. Um, the war will continue on in the Pacific for several more months. Of course, this will lead to uh, the, the heavy casualties that the U.S. suffers. 
um, due to the refusal of the Japanese to surrender um, leads us to determine it's time for us to use our new weapons that we had been developing really to use against the Germans but the Germans had lost the war before we had a chance to use them on them we decide to drop atomic bombs on two key areas in Japan Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 finally bringing World War II to a close some of what happens during the war however needs to be discussed in terms other than battles the Holocaust remember the Nuremberg laws of 1935 had already established a precedent for targeting Jews in German occupied territories it gets worse as we approach um, the beginning of World War II with Kristallnacht and then of course the deportation of the Jews into certain ghetto communities in German occupied lands and eventually um, concentrating those Jews into labor camps most of them located in Poland this of course will lead to eventually by the time the Germans are losing the war um, an effort to exterminate the Jewish race before they lose the war the final solution uh, this is why six million Jews are killed most in the last year of the war um, and at the Wannsee conference after the war is over it is determined that <clears throat> these crimes against humanity need to be punished uh, with uh, the death of the ringleaders of those who um, were followed the orders of the Fuhrer to launch this final solution the aftermath of the war of course innocent civilians killed the Holocaust is a perfect example of that but other innocents as well innocents in China um, being killed by uh, the Japanese fire bombings in Germany and Japan by American and British forces and Soviet forces atomic bombs of course rapes of German women by Soviet troops and vice versa uh, denazification is going to have to happen after the war as well and that will be a difficult task um, but that is one of the reasons why uh, Germany will be occupied by the victors of the war it will have to be divided between East and West though because the Soviets do not see eye to eye with the Western nations um, Nuremberg trials will be will happen to um, uh, try the uh, Nazi ringleaders that are left for crimes against humanity and uh, this will lead to the zero hour the darkest point in human history uh, where they will be occupied um, denazification happens and eventually they will recover as a result of that occupation World War II ultimately however sets the stage for yet another war but this is a different kind of war this is a Cold War it is an ideological war if you will an ideological struggle ultimately between the two biggest victors of the war the United States representing Western democracy and the Soviet Union representing um, communism so in in essence it is capitalism versus communism uh, issues during the Cold War of course the United States as the leader of the Western capitalist democracies believes that no longer can we appease dictators the appeasement policy prior to World War II showed us that so we instead will try to contain communism with the containment policy uh, the uh, launching of a second front versus Germany was something that the Soviet Union had pushed for during the war and since we delayed starting that second front opening up you know with the battle um, that with D-Day in until 1944 that caused resentment amongst uh, the Soviet the Soviets towards the West and of course the use of the atomic bomb concerns um, the Soviet leadership as well if we can use that bomb on Japan we can also use it on them in this ideological struggle after World War II so the Soviet Union will work very hard oftentimes sending spies and espionage to build their own atomic weaponry during the Cold War
the Yalta Conference is really where we see the beginning of the Cold War. It's at the end of uh, World War II. It's actually before the, the war is actually completely over. But it shows us the chilly relationship between the Western nations and the Soviet Union already beginning. The agreements that were made there, dividing Germany into four zones of occupation, um, ultimately the Western zones will be, you know, under the leadership of the United States, but really there's a United States section, a British section, and a French section, and then of course the Eastern half will be under the Soviets occupying forces. Each occupying power will be responsible for setting up governments in those areas and keeping law and order and denazifying those areas. <clears throat> Stalin showed signs that the Red Army would not leave occupied territories such as Poland early on here at the Yalta Conference, and this is going to be a bone of contention during the Cold War. The Potsdam Conference at the end of another conference at the end of World War II um, was another issue uh, where we see the uh, Cold War beginning even before World War II was officially over. This was held in July of 1945. At this point, Harry Truman is president because FDR had um, died in office just a couple of months before. <clears throat> this, the discussion of free elections in occupied territories kind of went nowhere. Stalin doesn't want them. Um, and ultimately, he it makes it clear that he wants to create a buffer zone between the Soviet Union and the Western democracies by taking those territories and creating satellite states out of them. The whole use of the atomic bomb is discussed there, um, and of course, the decision will be made to use the atomic bomb against Japan. Alliances and international organizations that come into play as we exit World War II and enter the Cold War. Um, of course, the United Nations is created um, with the object being collective security. The idea is that the United Nations would be a more successful kind of international organization that replaced the failed League of Nations that, that fell apart uh, as World War II was beginning. Collective security uh, the Security Council is a major difference with the um, United Nations will have with the League of Nations. The Security Council ultimately will have a, some permanent members of the big power nations, which included the United States, Great Britain, France, China, and of course the Soviet Union. Um, and they have veto power. Ultimately, this was created the United States thought to keep the Soviets at bay, being able to use that veto power against them, but ultimately um, the Soviets will use the veto power against Western initiatives for the first several years of the creation of the UN. NATO was also created kind of as a counterpoint um, to the power of the Soviet Union as they had taken over Eastern Europe and created satellite states. Um, it was a way for the U.S. to try to keep um, these Western nations from falling to communism, for us to contain communism with the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the Warsaw Pact will be Stalin's retaliation to that. Um, the, his satellite states will be, will be part of these Warsaw Pact nations. They basically are the Soviet Union's domain, whereas NATO will be the U.S.'s domain. So again, showing you the world divided between two sides once again, but this time more of an ideological struggle than actual fighting. Now, Keenan's long telegram um, is what, Keenan was the architect of the policy of containment. This, of course, will be the U.S. goal throughout the duration of the Cold War. The goal was that we needed a long-term, patient but firm, vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies, meaning containing communism where it already existed, not letting it spread any further. This does not mean rolling it back out of Eastern Europe, but containing it where it already existed, not letting it spread further. This would be Harry Truman's policy, which was outlined in the Truman Doctrine. 
this of course initiated the notion of Winston Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech where he saw that there was a dividing line between Western democracy and Western Europe and the United States and of course Eastern communism with the satellite states to the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union in the eastern part of Europe. The Marshall Plan will be another part of the con um, containment policy though. Besides the Truman Doctrine being kind of the ideology of containment, the economic aspect of the containment policy will be the Marshall Plan. The United States once again, like we did after World War I, will uh, give financial aid to the countries of Europe to try to keep them from falling to communism. Since the only totalitarianism that is left was left-wing totalitarianism, communism, we know that economically depressed nations are more vulnerable to totalitarian takeovers. This was necessary. So we will spend billions of US dollars giving financial aid to all countries that ask in order to rebuild their economies. This is primarily done in Western Europe, uh, but it's also done in places in Southeast Asia as well. Um, have countries favored democracy and prevent support for communist, the Communist Party was one of the reasons. Stalin, of course, did not allow the Eastern Bloc countries to receive assistance through the Marshall Plan because they were under his Warsaw Pact. Uh, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Western Germany were lent the most money and the survival of those nations, those economies being um, salvaged, largely has to do with the Marshall Plan. And we invested in these countries knowing that they it would later pay off and having stronger trade partners down the road. Another outcome of, the, of World War II is also the end to imperialism. No longer could those nations in Europe afford to maintain their colonies. So we see, uh, you know, imperial colonies being let go and giving, given independence one by one after the war is over. In particular, you see Israel, Britain is out of Palestine, Israel is created as a nation for the world's Jews. Um, but there will be conflict there between the Israelis and the Palestinians for years to come, even to this day. Um, Egypt, the Suez Canal, is nationalized um, by Nasser and ultimately um, meaning that it belongs to Egypt now. It no longer is under the control of the British. In Africa, independent nations would be recognized one by one. You can review those notes individually to see the different nations that were given their freedom and when. India is given its independence by Great Britain in 1947, resulting in a partitioning of India between the northern uh, Muslim territory of Pakistan and the southern Hindu, Hindi territory of India. Uh, in Algeria, France is out. France uh, lets go of their colony of Algeria in northern Africa. In Vietnam, France held on to it a little bit longer until the mid 50s, but finally it leaves. L this leads to a divided Vietnam, the northern half being communist, the southern half being um, a republic, and ultimately the northern half trying to take over the southern half leads us under the containment policy in the United States into the Vietnam conflict, the Vietnam War, to try to save the southern republic from a communist takeover. And ultimately that will be a failure in the long run. Uh, the European Union, however, is another thing that comes out of the post-war world uh, in Europe. Uh, to still having to keep an eye on Germany, uh, but they want to try to create a, a realm of more um, friendly relationships and cooperation between the European nations to try to keep any kind of friction between those nations bringing about another world war. So ultimately we see an end of competition between countries in Europe, an easing of tensions, and this allows for eventually the creation of the European Union many years down the road by the time we get into the 80s and 90s.
Steps to European unity can be seen, however, all the way back to the post-World War II world. In 1948, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, OEEC, which started with Marshall Plan aid and began a process of lowering tariffs and eliminating trade barriers among the European nations, not, of course, the Eastern European nations under St Soviet control, though. Uh, 1951, the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC, that included France, West Germany, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. 1977, the European Economic Community, or Common Market, was formed, lifting all trade restrictions between members. Britain, Ireland, and Denmark were brought in. As we know, Britain has now exited that. Brexit. <laughs> Brexit. Uh, 1992, however, the European Union was formed with the Maastricht Treaty, which created common currency, that euro dollar, uh, except for in England. Um, uh, they did uh, allow for the euro dollar to come into England, but they maintained their control over the British pound as well, which served them well since they have now exited the European Union with Brexit. Uh, cooperation in defense, justice, and environmental um, uh, cooperation was also part of the European Union agreement. Post-World War II developments in Great Britain, of course, the Labour Party comes to power once again and initiates a huge amount of social welfare programs that they're able to fund with Marshall Plan dollars. The National Health Service offers free health care to all Brits. Um, the nationalization of industries also happens, but it also ushers in an age of austerity. Um, uh, trying to, to be able to afford those things, they have to cut back in other areas. Uh, issues in Ireland, however, continue. Northern Irish Catholics killing, being killed by British soldiers. Um, causes more problems between those nations. Uh, they were opposed to the British presence in Northern Ireland and wanted a completely free Ireland. These issues will continue, as I said, throughout the, um, till the late 20th century. Uh, Post-war developments in France, they had to deal with the early defeat in World War II. They were occupied early on in World War II by the Germans and will not be liberated until the middle of 1944. Um, mass deportations of Jews to camps while they were occupied um, by the Germans was also something that they, um, they had to deal with. Uh, problems with Vichy France and the collaboration that Vichy, the Vichy government had with Germany. Um, all of this had to be dealt with uh, in the post-war world. Uh, early support for communism to rebuild France. Um, uh, was an issue. Uh, they did not, um, they would not receive aid from the United States though if this happened and so eventually that will be abandoned and instead uh, they will uh, adopt the Monet plan which was the economy would be run by technocrats. Uh, it will allow for foreign investment and ra a rational central planning to occur in the Fourth Republic and eventually also the Fifth Republic. Germany, of course, as we know, was divided into occupation zones by the Soviets, the U.S., the Brit Britain, and France. The Berlin Wall uh, will eventually come about, Berlin, because Berlin was divided as well as the capital city. Um, the East becomes communist while Britain, France, and the U.S. combine their zones, in zones into Western Germany. The Berlin Airlift was the first test to the U.S. containment policy when the Soviets tried to take over West Berlin, um, and they will not be successful. This will eventually result in the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961 by the Soviets to try to prevent people from Eastern Germany leaving in, and to go to freedom in Western Germany and Western Berlin. The wall, however, will be brought down in 1989 with the fall of communism. German reunification happens officially in 1991.
The collapse of communism is also another thing that we see in the post-war world. Finally, as we move through the 80s and into the early 90s, the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989 was sort of the beginning of the end, showing the collapse of communism. One by one, those Eastern Bloc countries will fall away from communism. Um, Soviets tried to crush attempts of reform in Hungary, uh, but ultimately they will, um, uh, they will have to let go of those satellite states. Uh, power struggles within the party in the Soviet Union um, will cause some issues as well. The Cuban Missile Crisis was part of that. Um, the fact that Khrushchev was not able to, quote, win in the Cuban Missile Crisis and he had to back down to the U.S. under Kennedy uh, causes some friction within the party. He loses his base of support in the party um, and some uh, others will come to power in the Communist Party as a result. Brezhnev and then eventually of course Gorbachev. Um, Czechoslovakia uh, it's uh, where we see the Prague Spring in 1968 them trying to move away from communism. Uh, the Brezhnev Doctrine was declared however to try to a last ditch effort to try to maintain control over those Eastern Bloc, those Soviet Bloc countries. Uh, his willingness, Brezhnev's willingness to use the military to crush reform movements in those Eastern Bloc countries um, ultimately, that will bring them back under Soviet control throughout the 70s and into the uh, through the mid 80s, but eventually they will um, lose control over those territories. The collapse of the Soviet Union will start to happen in the mid to late 80s. As we said, the biggest challenge was in Poland. Poland and Lech Walesa called for worker strikes under the Solidarity Movement. Um, elections will eventually be held and the communists lost um, and so ultimately they will fall away from Soviet control. The Soviets can no longer really afford to maintain their military dominance in those areas. Gorbachev hoped that they would maintain their communist governments even without the Soviet presence there. But as we see, starting in Poland and then moving into 1989 under hun in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Albania, all having free elections and pushing out the communists peacefully. Uh, Romania was the only country to have violence to push their leader out, the Nikola uh, Cesco. But um, ultimately, we see because the Soviets could no longer afford to maintain their military presence in those Eastern Bloc countries, Gorbachev hoping under um, perestroika that they would maintain their communist governments and, and still maintain their uh, friendly relationship with the Soviet Union, it did not happen. They chose freedom instead, and ultimately, we see the collapse of the Soviet Union as a result. More collapse, of course, within the Soviet Union. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev wanting to bring economic reform to Russia because they could no longer afford to maintain things the way they had under Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Uh, Glasnost, of course, was one of the first things that opened debate in public openness. Perestroika, the economic restructuring. All of this, of course, causes a new Russian Republic to be born under Boris Yeltsin starting in 1991. Soviet Union collapses and the Russian Republic is born.